this could be the biggest deal breaker for this camera. Hey, what's up? Over the last month, I have spent countless hours with this little beast, the Sony ZV-E1, putting it through its paces in nearly every possible condition. The real test for the Sony ZV-E1 came on a day that was really close to my heart, and that was my daughter's communion in wildly fluctuating lighting conditions. There was, on this day, no room for error. Did this beast rise to the occasion? Can it really offer professional, amazing looking video and even photos, despite its size? And what about its known limitations? I've got a month's worth of experience to share, including all the trials, tribulations, and triumphs on the Sony ZV-E1. Let's get into it. First up is the video quality. It's phenomenal. What would you expect though from the same sensor that's in the Sony A7S III and Sony's baby cinema camera, the Sony FX3. Sony ZV-E1's got the exact same sensor, so the video quality is nuts. It's got the latest edition of Sony's color science and the picture profiles that are here for video are bonkersly good. More on those though in a sec because there is one picture profile that everybody should be using. In the video mode, it's got a bunch of different stabilization. It's got the active steady shot, which is okay and good. And then it's got something that's called dynamic stabilization, which if you use it correctly, you will probably never have to put this camera on a gimbal. Low light performance is something that a lot of cameras struggle with, regardless of what the brand is, it doesn't matter. However, the Sony ZV-E1, again, having that same incredible sensor that's in the FX3, it's a beast in low light. So if you're shooting stuff at night or in something that has got wildly fluctuating lighting conditions, like I had recently at my daughter's communion, this camera has the potential, if you use it correctly, to just plow through and eat up low light. While the Sony ZV-E1 is a video-centric camera, that doesn't mean it can't take photographs. In fact, for my daughter's communion, this was my primary camera when it came to shooting photographs. And as you can see, it absolutely did not let me down when it came to photographs. Regardless of the conditions, it just Boom, it worked. So there is one kind of downside to photography on the Sony ZV-E1, and depending on what type of camera that you're coming from, you may struggle with the lack of an EVF. So you've got no viewfinder to look through, so you're just looking at the screen. Some people prefer that personally. I like to make a better connection with the subject or whatever I'm shooting through the viewfinder because you've got less distractions in your peripheral vision. But that's only a small gripe and it's not like it's going to be a surprise when you get the camera go, oh, it doesn't have an EVF, where, where, where's it gone? There's a huge standard feature on the Sony ZV-E1 and regardless of what Sony camera you have, as far as I'm concerned, at this particular moment in time, this is top of the pile, this is top of the game, and I'm talking about the autofocus in the Sony ZV-E1. It is phenomenal. Whatever AI jiggery pokery that Sony use, whatever, who cares? It's just incredibly reliable. I'm shooting this on the Sony FX3, and every now and again, I'm just taking a look at the screen to make sure that I am in focus and it's tracking my head or my eye. With the Sony ZV-E1, I've been that confident with it. I don't pay no attention to whether I'm in focus or not. I just know it's going to be there. It's going to be locked on and it works incredibly well. In fact, it works so well, I actually thought I had the wrong lens on the camera. I know what you're thinking, you're like, that, that sounds nuts. Well, recently I used the Sigma 600 mil, I have the Canon version of it, so I used an adapter to E-mount. And for some surf photography, I was blown away by how accurate the autofocus was. It just locked on to whatever I pointed it at. And the reason I felt that I had a completely different lens on the camera was simply because the Sigma 600 mm lens with the Canon to E-mount converter is, let's say, slow at autofocus. This thing it performed like a completely different lens. Having a big, big lens on a small, small camera does bring into play the questions about the ergonomics. How does this feel in the hand? After a month of use, the Sony ZV-E1 does feel good in the hand. For a lot of people who are creating content, it's not going to be in your hand that often because you're probably gonna have it just like stuck onto a little handheld tripod or a normal tripod. But there is a huge downside to having something so powerful in such a small body. This generates a ton of heat because it's so small. I think Sony have not done a great job on the thermals here because if you're USB streaming on this, if you saw a recent video that I made, what's the, oh, hang on. 
it's gone as i was warbling on so what do we get an hour and seven minutes and that's with the auto temp power off thing set to high all those things all the doors open everything so unless you're going to kind of jerry rig a tiny little fan to the camera as a few people have then usb streaming is a no-go unless you're doing kind of less than an hour or a quick work video call or something like that it look amazing but you just got to keep that in mind from an indoor perspective, I've shot quite a number of videos with the Sony ZV-E1 in this studio here. It's summertime where I am right now, and let me tell you, it's anywhere between like 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and when you put studio lights on, this room gets incredibly warm. The camera has got warm, but shooting like talking head videos or whatever for, you know, over an hour, zero problem. I think the overheating stuff on the Sony ZV-E1 has been blown out of proportion. That's not to say though, it doesn't happen. It does, but I think it's just something that you gotta be conscious of. Something else that you've gotta be conscious of when it comes to the Sony ZV-E1, and this is probably the most underused feature that I've had on the camera for the last month. That's the onboard mic. I don't like it. I think the audio sounds very kind of thinny and hollow, like a depth, like a bass, like a warmth. The mic which does all different directions and is just set to auto. Even though it's got great functionality where the camera figures out if you're talking from behind it or in front of it or all around it, it's a nice feature to have, but I just don't think the audio is there. So you do have to get an external mic, even a cheap external mic will make a difference. Or if you're fancy yourself as a bit of an audio engineer, you can do some post-production on, on this and just make it sound a little bit better. Mic which does all different directions and is just set to auto. Another downside with the Sony ZV-E1, if you're a beginner, and this could be a deal breaker, is the menu system. So it's got Sony's newest menu system, which is really good, it's really intuitive. And because the screen is completely, you know, touch sensitive, you can touch all the menu things and that's all good. But there's a lot of functionality in the camera and you really gotta spend some time in the Sony ZV-E1 to figure out what's what. There's a lot of menu options in there. A lot of them you will never need to use, but you gotta figure out what you're gonna use and what you're gonna not use and then customize the camera. Now, if you wanna figure out all the settings, I've got an actual video that's completely dedicated to all the settings in the Sony ZV-E1. It's gonna be at the end of this video or there's a link in the description to check it out. However, Speaking of lots of functionality and lots of things in the menus, there's an absolute ton of bells and whistles in this camera. Now, like the menus, there's a lot of things that you will probably never use. It's got a whole lot of options like reframing. It's got cinematic vlog mode. It's got all these things, right? And if you're starting out, they're great just to achieve whatever you want with that look or black bars or whatever. Personally, for me, they're not for me, even though some of these, including the reframing thing, are really, really impressive. So there's lots of bells and whistles to take into account. But for me, probably the biggest thing that you can have in this camera is something that will make your footage very similar to something that's a lot more expensive. And I'm talking about the cinematic picture profile called S Cinetone. This was designed from Sony's Venice cameras. It's designed to have a really quick workflow that directly out of the camera, this picture profile, if you use it, the skin tones are, they're perfect. So it's a picture profile that I've shot nearly consistently for the last month. I've forgotten about all the other ones, including the S Log ones. It just looks amazing. Directly out of camera, you need to do very little, if anything at all. So that's what I would suggest. If you are using the Sony ZV-E1, drop it into PP11, which is S Cinetone, drop the detail down to minus seven, and then you've got something that looks quite cinematic and is ready to go. So that's one of the big other standout features on the Sony ZV-E1. Now there's another feature that when this camera came out, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a game changer. And I'm talking about dynamic stabilization, which is probably one of the biggest bones of contention around the Sony ZV-E1. The stabilization modes in the Sony ZV-E1, you've got none, you've got active stabilization, Steady shot, which is okay. It's not the best, but it's good enough. And then you've got something called dynamic stabilization, which is almost a gimbal killer. Now it comes with a huge caveat, and that is that dynamic stabilization crops in about 30, 30 odd percent, 30, 30, about 30 percent. And depending on the lens that you're using, that could be way too much. So something like a 16 mil lens, like I've got the Viltrox 16 mil on right now, 
that works incredibly well with dynamic stabilization. So as you can see from this clip here, my daughter's communion, we got a low light scenario in a church. I was just literally walking backwards, not ninja walking, and the footage came out really, really good. I was really happy with it. That's dynamic stabilization in full effect. So you can see it's quite a wide shot, and that is even with that 30% crop. Now, there's another downside to using dynamic stabilization and depending on the type of stuff that you're shooting and the look that you want, this could be the biggest deal breaker for this camera. In fact, it's a deal breaker for some other cameras that have something similar like GoPros. To get dynamic stabilization looking amazing, you can't really use a low shutter speed. So shutter speed like one over 50 or one over 60, that's that magic cinematic shutter speed which gives you motion blur, which means everything has a blur, which is very natural to look. However, if you dial the shutter speed up to like one over a thousand or one over 2000 or something like that, then the stabilization is it's like, oh man. But the downside of that is everything looks very weird and staggered and it's quite unnatural to look at so you gotta really keep that in mind otherwise dynamic stabilization bone of contention but it's really really good after using the sony zve one consistently for a solid month I've got to say that this is not a USB streaming camera. This is something that I don't think Sony can fix with firmware at all. But that aside, the video quality, the photo quality, essentially the sensor quality, what you get out of it, it's amazing. Now, there are a couple of shortcomings as I've highlighted on the Sony ZV-E1. A lot of those so far haven't been really frustrating for me. They haven't been a deal breaker as such. The fact that you're aware of it, yeah. I mean, that's something that I think everybody needs to be aware of. There is no perfect camera. I think that's something that everybody has to keep in mind as well. There's none, it doesn't exist. The size of the Sony ZV-E1 is another huge plus for me. It fits into the bag really, really well. It's a tiny camera. And to be honest, as expensive as it is, it's not as expensive as my Sony FX3. So if I'm traveling or doing whatever, I much prefer to bring this as opposed to the Sony FX3, even though both are really expensive to replace if something goes wrong. The cost of the Sony ZV-E1 is, yeah, it ain't cheap. This is an expensive camera, depending on where you buy it. And I'm sure one could argue that for the price, you wouldn't expect the shortcomings that are with the camera, but I think you ultimately have a sacrifice with any camera that you buy, no matter what the cost, there is always some kind of trade-offs. And the trade-offs on the Sony ZV-E1, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're not deal-breaking, as I've said. Now, this camera, for me, the autofocus, the color science, the video quality, that's without even thinking about the photos. This has made the Sony ZV-E1 one of my favorite cameras in quite some time definitely worth considering. But the one piece of advice I'll give anybody here before you buy or think about buying the Sony ZV-E1, you absolutely have to think about what you're shooting. If you're in a really warm climate with like 120 degree heat, this, like a lot of cameras, is not for you. But you gotta really, besides the heat thing, you gotta figure out what are you shooting? Is it photography? Is it video? Is it blogs? Is it gonna be just a talking head thing? Is you going to be moving about all the time? So write all those things down and then have a think about the Sony ZV-E1 because the size, the reliability of this thing, it does a hell of a lot for, obviously it's expensive, but I think the bang for book that you get from this camera, I'm really impressed guys. And I don't say that lightly, I genuinely, genuinely like this camera.